story of Joshua began as a slave in Egypt under cruel Egyptian taskmasters. And because of his walk with God and his loyalty to God's man, Joshua succeeded the great leader of Moses. Every person's life intersects history, only few impact it. Joshua's ability or his availability to God, it led him to be able to experience the profound joy of influencing and being a blessing to the world around him and, uh, and still being a blessing today as uh, we preach and, and uh, we read through the book of Joshua. Joshua successfully directed the Israelite army in its conquest of the promised land as we've looked at in previous chapters. It was Henry Blackaby that wrote, he said, spiritual leaders take people from where they are to the place where God intends for them. And that's absolutely right. Every generation, I would say, yearns for spiritual leaders who are obedient to God's plan of making a difference in the lives of the people that surround them. Many Christians are satisfied with merely living out their individual existences, uh, only pursuing their uh, temporal pleasures. Some are seduced into thinking that their purpose in this world is only for their own gain and for their own fame. They believe that. However, thank God for those who desire to leave this world a better place than when they found it, when they first came. This world needs spiritual leaders who are willing to love God, to love others, and make a difference. A humble, committed, passionate servant of God is a perfect conduit of God to release his unparalleled power. And that's what we find in the life of a Joshua. Obedience and faith and dependence on God. It made Joshua uh, uh, one of Israel's strongest leaders. And as we have seen, God used him mightily. He provides a bold example for us today. And in our sermon, we see the closing. That's the title of our sermon today, the closing. This is the end of Joshua's life. Verse 1, it says in verse two, chapter 23, Now it came to pass, a long time after the Lord had given rest to Israel from all their enemies round about, that Joshua was old, advanced in age. We've already seen previously in the Bible several deathbed words. I, I thought about putting in this sermon, which I have other sermons and many other sermons, so I chose not to. But it's always interesting to read the last words of people. You know, um, uh, there are a lot of very famous people, a lot of Christian leaders have had some wonderful words, some some sad words. Their last words are very sad. But previously in the Bible, here we find Jacob and Moses and others have given deathbed words. And now Joshua, who has been their leader for 40 years in the land of promise, gives some very important words to, uh, to Israel uh, before his death. Joshua, number first of all, in this chapter 23, Joshua's final communication. His final communication, verse 2. And Joshua called for all Israel, for their elders, for their heads, for their judges, and all their officers, and said to them. Now, Joshua called the people around, and he says, I'm getting older, I'm closer to death, I have some final words to you. Uh, and his final words were made up of, first of all, remembering God's deliverance. Verse 3. You have seen all that the Lord your God has done to all these nations because of you. For the Lord your God is he who has fought for you. Uh, avoiding temptation to uh, elevate himself, Joshua reminded the, uh, the people there of Israel that their enemies had been defeated solely on the fact that God had fought for them. That's what he's doing here. My friend, there isn't room in Canaan for man-made self-syndrome. Uh, there wasn't any room for that. And as you read on down through verse 8, and uh, uh, actually on really the last two chapters, 
you can hear the concern in Joshua's voice. Uh, it just bleeds over of how he's concerned about the future of the people of God. Whether they're going to, they're going to take their stand for the Lord, continue to take their stand as they have in the past. He knows what it looks like when the spirit of self takes charge and surrenders uh, to the, uh, rather than surrendering to the leadership of God. He knows what that looks like. And uh, he's concerned about that. He was concerned about, Joshua was concerned about complacency. He was concerned that they would take the law of God for granted. He was concerned that their fervor for the things of God and their walk with God would soon begin to fade. And tragically, I would tell you that he, is, he was right because as you read on through the, New Te- the Old Testament, uh, you will find that that's exactly what happened later on. They came to the place that they were complacent. And I would dare say that this is a description of many modern churches today. They are a lot like the Laodicean church in the book of Revelation where people allow themselves to be satisfied with their own spiritual condition and as a result of it, they allow sinful conditions in their hearts to go unchallenged. You know what God said about these kind of people? Boy, he sure is stern about it in Revelation 3 and verse 16. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. That's what God says. Pretty straightforward, is it not? It's just sickening to God is what it is. And many people in churches today are that way. Joshua was concerned about compromise. Another thing he was concerned about, he was concerned about them going after the false gods of Canaan. He was concerned about them bowing down to a false god. And you know what? His concerns were justified because that is exactly what happened to Israel later on. You'll find it as you read through the Old Testament that the children of Israel begin to compromise. Many so-called Christians are bowing to God's false gods today. They go to places and they do things that they know in their heart that God would not approve. They know that, and yet they justify it by saying, well, so-and-so does it, or uh, everybody does it. As a teenager would say, well, everybody does that, Mom, you know. And uh, you know what? It's not just teenagers that say that. Adult people say that, too. If they don't say it, they think it in their mind. Some do. And then they come to church on Sunday and say, oh, how I sing. Oh, how I love Jesus. You know, but yet they're, they've compromised. What Charles Spurgeon said, he said, I believe that one reason why the church of God at this present moment has so little influence over the world is because the world has so much influence over the church. And he's absolutely right. God help us to remember what he has done for us in the past and keep our focus on loving him and serving him. But not only that, Joshua was concerned about commitment. He was concerned that over a period of time that they would not cleave to the Lord as they should. And our level of commitment to the Lord ought to be a concern to us too. It ought to be a concern every day. It ought to be a concern every week of just how committed we are to the Lord. Joshua reminds the people that it was God who delivered them. And friend, I will tell you, it would do us well to remind ourselves every day that it was God who saved our sinful soul. It was God who wrote our names down in his eternal book, the Lamb's Book of Life. It was God who gave us a purpose for living, and it is God who promises us a future home in heaven. It would do us well to remember that. The Apostle Paul says, For it is God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. It's God. God's the one that has seen us through in all these things. And so Joshua closes out his life. He challenges them to remember what God has done. Because of God's faithfulness, we too ought to be faithful to him. Then second of all, look at the recognizing of God's directives in verse 11. Therefore take careful heed to yourselves that you love the Lord your God. 
Now the grave danger of crossing the Jordan River, facing an enemy in a strange land, encounter, encountering the unknown uh, uh, on every hand, and meeting fears on every side, uh, that is, that that's what kept Israel close to the Lord. All those things, those dangers, kept them close to the Lord. And you know what? That's the story of uh, human nature. That's the story of life. It never changes. The same thing has happened in America when God favored us after World War II. Now, many of us aren't old enough to remember that, but we read about it. We understand it. We understand American history. And uh, while other nations are going through, they were going through a period of hardship uh, after World War II, uh, some of them because of uh, the, the evilness of what they had put into the world, while they're suffering for, through the hardship, our nation entered an era of prosperity and affluence. That's what happened to America. We know it's true. We've seen the history of it. But please allow me to inject here I believe that God was testing us at that time with prosperity. We've been a very prosperous nation, and God was testing us with that prosperity. Exactly what is America doing today with that prosperity is the question that I ask you. And exactly what are we as believers doing with that prosperity? And hear me loudly when I tell you that the most dangerous period that any people can go through is not a time of grave danger and suffering. That's not the the, the that's not a, 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 the dangerous time. But the dangerous time is the time of peace and unity. We've got to be careful. We've got to watch out. Joshua communicated to them that it is imperative that they remember God's deliverance. When you're having a time of prosperity, be careful you don't forget it was God who did that. And you continue to depend upon him. David tells it to us like this in Psalm 103 too. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. You better not forget it, what God has done for us. Then third of all, respecting God's disciplines in verse 12 and 13. Or else, if indeed you do go back and cling to the remnant of these nations, these that remain among you and make marriages with them and go in to them and they to you, know for certain that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations from before you, but they shall be snares and traps to you and scourges on your sides and thorns in your eyes until you perish from this good land which the Lord your God has given you. Well, that's just very stern words. Very straightforward of what he is saying. If the children of Israel, if they ever did turn against the Lord, Joshua is telling them there's going to be a loss. There's going to be a loss if you ever turn your back on the Lord. There would be the loss of power, the first thing. God no longer fight their battles for them. There would be the loss of protection. Uh, the, the warning in verse 13, verse 13 of their enemies overcoming them. It reminds me of uh, the story of Samson who lost his power because he was drifting from God. And then he lost his protection from the Philistines. And once his power was gone, they, they put, out of his, put out his eyes and they put him in prison. And it reminds us of the disobedience to God, the disregard of God and the disloyalty for God. It always carries a hefty price tag it always does we never sin for free there's always a cost when we turn our backs on almighty God we find that there would be a loss of possessions God had been so good to them in giving them the Canaan that could all be lost he told them you'll lose it God gave it to you but you'll lose it and think how about Think of how much more joy and contentment we could have in life if we walk spiritually closer to God. There would be the loss of peace. Verse 16 speaks of how they would lose their peace. And Christian, you don't want to lose your peace. I observe a lot of Christians that have lost their peace. 
You don't want to lose your peace. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. We don't have to do that. We don't have to be people without peace. We don't have to go through life like that. If we just walk close with the Lord. Puritan John Owen said, We cannot enjoy peace in this world unless we are ready to yield to the will of God. And I like what C.S. Lewis said, God cannot give us happiness and peace apart from himself because it is not there. There is no such thing. That's what he says. There's no such thing as true peace without the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Joshua wanted peace and he wanted happiness for the children of Israel. So in this closing words, he, he hammers here in this chapter 23 to the people here uh, that they strongly remember God's deliverance, God's directives, and God's disciplines. He hammers that home to them. Then we move on to chapter 24, Joshua's firm challenge. In chapter 23, he gathers the people, but in chapter 24, he gathers the leaders together to give them a firm challenge. And one of the, one of the most well-known passages in the scripture is part of the firm challenge given by Joshua. And that is found uh, down there in verse 15. Choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. You see that on, uh, you see that put up on uh, people's, in their houses, uh, framed, uh, that scripture verse. That verse is probably framed and put on a wall probably more in a home, more than any other scripture verse. You know, because it's talking about me and my house. We're going to serve God. That's, that's, uh, that's all together there. Choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. There are known, they were known as the 40 martyrs of Sebaste. And in the famed 12th legion of the Rome, Rome's imperial army, there were 40 soldiers who professed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And one day their captain informed them that the emperor Licinius that he had sent out a, a, a decree that uh, commanding officers to tell all the men that they were to sacrifice to the emperor. They were to bow to the emperor. These Christian warriors said, you can have our, our, our armor, you can even have our bodies, but our hearts, our allegiance belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. And because of their stance for the Lord, as many Christians down through the history of time that have suffered greatly for Christ, but as, as a result of it, they stripped their clothes of them and they marched them out on a frozen lake in the midwinter of A.D. Uh, 320. At that time, they could renounce Christ if they wanted to and they could come back and save themselves from death. But instead, they huddled close together and they sang their song of victory. Forty martyrs for thee, O Christ, to win for thee the victory and from thee the victor's crown. Over and over they sang the song. And that freezing night, they saw 39 of those men would freeze to death. And when there was but yet one man left, he stumbled to the shore and he renounced Christ. After witnessing the commitment of those 39 men that had taken their stand, willing to die because they loved the Lord Jesus Christ, the officer in charge of guarding those men, he had come because I'm sure they had witnessed him. He came to know Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. While one man came off of the icy waters, the guard stripped himself of his clothes and walked out onto the frozen waters showing his faith in Jesus Christ. At sunrise, the Roman soldiers found 40 men who gave their all for the cause of Christ. They're all for the cause of Christ. Joshua was that kind of leader. That's the kind of man that he was. He gave his life for God, and his work uh, is an example for all of us to follow even to, to, to today. His people followed him while he was alive. That They lived for God. Sad to say, a sad story as you get into the book of, of um, Judges, of how you see the very next book in the Bible, 
how they soon begin to drift away because that great spiritual leader is off of the scene. Spiritual leaders have a mandate to help people become all God intends for them to be. That's what spiritual leaders do. And Joshua stands before the leaders at the closing of his life and he firmly challenges them to stand for God. You got to stand for God. That's what he firmly challenges them to do. He knew that it would not be easy for those leaders that he's speaking to. The UPU men are the ones that are leading this group of people. And uh, you've got to stand strong. It's not going to be easy for you. And understand that there will be many that will come along that will oppose you. Later on, the Apostle Paul comes along and he challenges us as Christians to be steadfast. Those are the words. Same words of Joshua in the Old Testament is the Apostle Paul in the New Testament. Be steadfast. Or he is saying, therefore, my br brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, stand firm. That's what he's saying. And as Joshua challenges them to make their choice of where, they're, where they are going to stand, look at his last words in this chapter. First, review past blessings. Once again, the way he reviewed it with God's people, he's bringing them back again with the leaders in verse 13. I have given you a land for which you... Now think about this. This is a powerful verse, and apply it to yourself. I have given you a land of which you, for which you did not labor and cities which you did not build and you dwell in them and you eat of the vineyards and the olive groves which you did not plant. God was so good to them. God given them all these things. Verses 2 through 13, Joshua reminds them of who they are and where they came from and what the Lord has done for them. You'll find that all the way down through there. Any greatness Israel achieved was not by their effort, but it was through God's grace and his enablement. That's why I have you say, well, they won the victory. God gave them the victory. Anytime they didn't look to the Lord, they didn't win the victory, if you'll remember. But uh, God gave them the victories. Israel's conquests, deliverances, and their prosperity. Hear me when I tell you, it was all, it was all by the good mercies of God and not by their own making. It was all by God's mercy. That is true of us today, my friend. What we are and have and we have is only by God's grace. It's only by what God has done for us. John Newton, the slave trader who became a Christian, wrote something in large letters and hung it above his mantle. And it was the scripture verse, Deuteronomy 15:15. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you. Well, what a powerful... You remember, he not only was a slave trader, he became a slave himself. But we're all, we're all that way, friend. We're all slaves. And Jesus came along and redeemed What John Newton is saying, we were all in that condition. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through His infinite mercy. His child I am, uh, child forever I am. Redeemed by the Lord. I just love the way that Sham, uh, Francis Schaeffer words, uh, his words on this subject. He said, whether studying the Old Testament or the New Testament, we are reminded that we are not where we are because of a long wise and godly heritage we come from rebellion individually we are children of wrath after we are Christians we must look at others who are still under God's wrath always say it is not because I am intrinsically better than you but because God has no place for pride that's what he said in other words, we don't, have, we don't have a right to look down our nose at anybody in this world. You know, uh, people that are sinning out in the world and, and think that we're any better than anybody else. We aren't where we are today by our own making. We're here because God saved us. It was by everything that God did for us. The songwriter had it right 
he knew what he was talking about when he wrote that song, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. When I stood condemned to death, he took my place. Now I live and breathe in them with each breath of life I take, loved and forgiven, backed with a living. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. If it wasn't for the grace of Almighty God, we wouldn't be here today, friend. If you had no other motivation to serve God, we should serve Him because of who He is uh, and what He has done for us. We ought to serve Him today. Then second of all, rehearsing Israel's present responsibility in verse 14. Now therefore, fear the Lord, serve Him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the river of Egypt. Serve the Lord. And if it seem evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river are the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. And the powerful words of that great leader, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I like a man like that, don't you? I like a man that will stand up and say, me and my house, we're going to serve God. We're going to church on Sunday. Kids, we're going to church on Sunday. We're going to love God. We're going to serve God. That's what's going to take place in this home. You know, Joshua was saying here, Do you, now you, you this with me. Do you want to serve the impotent God back in Egypt? Is that who you want to serve? Uh, do you want to serve the gods who demand you sacrifice your children uh, to them, like the Amorites do? Is that what you want? Or will you serve the true and living God? Is that what you're going to do? And later on, Elijah gave a stern challenge when he said, the same way Joshua had, Elijah comes on the scene, and you remember that story as he speaks to God's people in 1 Kings chapter 18. How long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him but if Baal, follow him. You make up your mind where you want to serve. I go back to the Laodicean church once again. Neither hot nor cold. You know, you, either, you be hot or you be cold. Don't be lukewarm. You know, if God's God, follow him. If Baal's God, then follow him, which he's not God. But the challenge is the same today. We look around and we see people, perhaps maybe from foreign lands, that worship the sun and the moon. Of course, we're seeing more in that more and more of that in America today. But those that worship these things, the mountains, the animals, the statues, and all these things, and we think of them as foolish. How foolish can they be that they would worship an object? You know, I often tell the story uh, in my mission sermons about uh, there in the Orient somewhere that they would go and they would, they would, uh, they would purchase a god out in farmlands, and they would purchase a god and put it up on the mantle and pray to that that God and and as uh, the the reaping time came if it was a poor harvest uh, that they would take that God down and they would beat it and they would burn it uh, and then they would go out and buy another God you know the the vicious circle goes on and on and, and we think how foolish that is however I would tell you that there are too many in our churches today who sacrifice a great deal on the altar of power and of pleasure and of finances the truth is that everybody, every person worships something or somebody. Every person does. God made us that way. You can find the most primitive person somewhere and they will be worshiping. Something they will be worshiping. God made us with a desire to worship. And the object of our worship will determine our future and uh, determine our, our, uh, define our lives. And so Joshua was telling them, you got to make up your mind of who you serve. That's what I was saying. Very stern about it. You make up your mind where you're going to stand. Verse 16 through 18, the people acknowledged God's goodness, and they said, we will also serve the Lord, for he is our God. Joshua knew how weak these people were, and so he challenges them again about the holiness of God and his righteous judgment. They come back again in verse 21, and they say, no, but we will serve the Lord. And Joshua comes back the third time, and he pulls off the mask of their lip service, and he says, 
If you mean it, then live by it. And that's the message today that's very strong to all Christians. If you mean it, friend, then you better live by it. If you mean, when you say you love God and that, you're, that you want to serve God, then live up to it. Don't let it just be lip service. And uh, Joshua goes on to saying, we're not going to have any uh, alternate gods here. We're not going to have any backups uh, if, if God doesn't do for you what you want him to do. And that, that applies thousands of years later of people, I can't tell you how many people through the years as a pastor that have walked away from God, walked away from the church because God didn't do what they wanted him to do. Well, God, you know, God just doesn't hear my prayers and he doesn't answer my prayers, you know, because it wasn't answered. What the truth of the matter is, if they, could, if they could pull back the curtain and see what God was doing, they'd see God had a plan. might have protected them from a great danger that would have come upon them. We don't know. We don't understand everything that God does, but we know that he is God and he has a right to do what he wants to do. And we, have a, and we know that it is... For it is for our good and for his glory. And so we don't question that. But the people spoke once again saying in verse 24, The Lord our God we will serve and his voice we will obey. He's really hitting them hard. And they say we will. The last thing revealing Israel's permanent pledges. Verse 25 and 26. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and made for them a statue and an, or, an ordinance in Shechem. Then Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God and he took a large stone and set it up there under the oak that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. And Joshua said to all the people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness to you, for it has, uh, for it has heard all the words of the Lord which he spoke to us. It shall therefore be a witness to you, lest you deny your God. So after Joshua is satisfied with their sincerity, Joshua drew up a terms of a binding covenant that the people were to worship, serve, and obey the true and living God. Joshua made a stone. It would be a permanent public marker, and it would, to, it would be there to remind them of God's faithfulness and their covenant with God. It will remind them of that. Uh, much like what you'd wear a wedding band, it reminds you, you know, not that you had to be, but it's important. Uh, identify, I belong. You know, it, it, was, uh, it was a marker, it was a reminder. And the remaining verses speak of the burial of three men, Joshua um, and the bones of I'm to speak on all these three, um, but I will tell you they were giants in the faith. There's a message just in the death of these three, but I just want to focus on the memorial of Joshua's and his legacy as we close out. He's one of God's symbols, a type of Christ. There are many in the Old Testament that are types of Christ. Joshua was one of them. He was God's succeeder appointed by God to be Moses' substitute, our successor. He was God's servant who, as a faithful warrior, leading Israel in taking possession of their land. He was God's servant who faithfully assigned the land uh, to the inheritance to the various tribes. You remember we brought a sermon on that uh, to the tribes and clans according to Moses' instructions as before. He was God's servant who faithfully reminded Israel about covenant faithfulness. That's who he was. And hear me today when I tell you, no greater tribute could be given to Joshua than the fact that he was simply called the servant of the Lord. There's no greater compliment you could pay him. And I'll tell you, there's no greater compliment that we could have today, friend. And I don't care who you are, where you live, what kind of background it is, you can be a servant of the Lord. Just a servant of the Lord. I had an aunt that I never knew. 
Her name was Elizabeth, but she died at 15 years old, killed in a car wreck. But she, my mom said she was going to be a missionary. You just see it written all over. And my mom's words of her, she was a servant of the Lord. She waited on everybody. She loved God. She served everyone, a servant of the Lord. What a great thing to say. Servant of the Lord. On April the 4th, 1964, there was a funeral procession downtown Virginia. Thousands of people lined the street as the horse-drawn carriage came down the street with a casket overladen with a flag and, and many flags around and flowers. There were rows of soldiers behind it and jets were flying overhead and there was he was a great soldier I'm talking about General Douglas MacArthur some say that perhaps he was the greatest soldier in American history just a few years earlier he appeared before Congress on April the 19th 1951 after being relieved of his duties by President Truman he stood there before that government body of people and he etched these words into history. It was his farewell speech. And this is what he said. The world has turned over many times since I first took the oath on the plane of my hopes and dreams away. But I still remember a popular barrack ballad whose refrain we would proudly proclaim. Old soldiers never die, they just fade away. You've heard it, haven't you? But like the old soldier in that ballad, I now close my military career and just fade away. An old soldier who tried to do his duty as God gave him the light to see that duty. I bid you farewell. In the same way, the book of Joshua, ends with an old soldier just saying farewell. All Joshua wanted at the closing was for God's people to understand the gravity of the decision to serve God. That's all they wanted. That's all that these last two chapters are about. And Christian, I ask you today, do you understand the gravity of serving the Lord? Do you understand that? The decision, I'm going to serve God. I hope when I face the crossing, my life will be a testimony of helping the next generation to see that loving and serving Jesus Christ is the most important thing in life. Young people, it's the most important thing. There's nothing, anything more important in this life than serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Joshua was a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. And hear me when I tell you, everything points back to Jesus Christ. Everything in the Old Testament points back to Jesus Christ. Everything in our life ought to point back to Jesus Christ. John, uh, Jesus said in John chapter 5, verse 24, Most assuredly I say unto you, He who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment but it's passed from death unto life. Lost friend, there's no life worth living outside of Jesus Christ. Come to Jesus today. He's the one who will give you an abundant life while you live, and he will give you eternal life one day in heaven. There's no life, there's no peace outside of Jesus Christ. It all points to Jesus. He's the only way. He's the only way of salvation. On the way to be forgiven of our sins, on the way to have eternal life with God the Father in heaven is through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ.
would you come and receive him today?